incredible. Way to go, God, right? There is a particular man that the Lord is working in, and I don't tell him enough of this, and I think it should be acknowledged that it is the Lord working, but I am so very thankful for Stephen Samick. This young man, uh, wow, he has uh, labored to uh, work on our music program and bring glory to God in our music program and does everything he can to have a high view of God in our worship, and it is extremely encouraging uh, to see uh, the fruit of his labor and God's grace at work. So, today, we are back in Matthew chapter 6, verse 31 to verse 34. We've been going through this section for a while now. and it, I should do this before, but of course I don't. And it's way down here on the bottom. Got it. We've been going through this section from 624 to the end of the chapter for three weeks now, and I promise I'm going to move on. This is the last week in this section, but I'm, I have been so encouraged, and I have been challenged so much, and the Lord has used these pa this passage to very much uh, convict me of my own worries and struggles, and yet also encourage me uh, with where my hope is found. And I hope you're encouraged too. And I hope you're preaching these truths to your heart day to day to day, over and over and over again in your lives. Uh, so we will continue and finish this week. How many of us allow the what-ifs of our life to control us? The what-ifs of our life. These are those times when we speculate about the possible bad outcomes of our life circumstances. Well, what if that happens? The more we think about it, the worse it, the worse it gets. Some of us are particularly prone to pessimism in the room. Anybody in here? A few of us, right? And when we package pe pessimism with a doubting heart, we can find bondage to worry and doubt and discouragement. Or maybe some of you in here worry about the if-onlys of life. The if-onlys. This is when we commiserate over the mistakes we've made in our past. Any of us in here struggle with that? If only I hadn't done that. We speculate over how much better our life would be if we had not made these mistakes. This is yet another form of worry. Friends, we are who we are in Christ, no matter what our past has been. We have all sinned in horrific ways in our past. I find it interesting that I have some people, we have some people visiting today uh, from Lakeland area. I'm not going to point them out or anything like that, but they're relatives of mine and I'm sitting here thinking, oh, yeah, they know Mike. They know Mike B.C. before Christ. And I could sit here and worry up here. If only I wouldn't have been that man. But I was. But who I am in Christ today has absolutely nothing to do with who I was then. We've all sinned. But everybody who has repented and believed in Jesus Christ is a new creation in Christ. And we don't need to think if only. Now, do our unwise decisions sometimes have consequences? Absolutely they do. But our unwise decisions must never determine our present joy. They must not determine whether we have peace in our hearts. 
Because joy is found in a relationship with Christ, knowing Him and abiding in Him. So worry comes from every different direction, doesn't it? What ifs and if onlys or just plain doubting over a trial that we're going through. Struggling. Can I make it? Am I going to make it? These are times when we must remind our hearts of the solutions to worry that our Lord has given us in this passage. We must counsel our souls exactly as God counsels our soul through His Word. And we must let the words of Christ richly dwell within our soul to help us to think biblically and think the way He wants us to think. So we've looked through this passage, and I kind of want to review quickly through them. They're kind of an overview of what we've learned so far. And if you have questions, you can ask me afterwards, or ask somebody that, if you're a visitor, you can always ask somebody that has been here before. We'd love to talk to you about it. Remember, the solutions for worry, the solutions for worry, we've seen so far are first... We must be devoted to God over the things of the world. We must be devoted to God over the things of this world. Notice in verse 25, again, it starts for this reason. For what reason? The reason that you are devoted to God over the things of wealth or the things of the world. In light of your devotion to God, since you're really devoted to God, Jesus says to his disciples, do not worry about your life. Our devotion helps us to avoid worry. So we must be devoted to God over the things of the world. Second, we must have a correct understanding of the difference between concern or concern and worry. The difference between concern and worry. Again, trials happen. We'll see it in our passage today in verse 34. Notice, so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. What's that imply? That there's troubles today. There's things that can cause concern today. Very interesting. We must understand that concern is legitimate. That is, when we see something that discourages us, when we see a direction that could go bad, those concerns can come across our hearts. We can have a loved one that we love dearly, that we see them making wrong choices and going the wrong direction, and that can be a legitimate concern. But what we do with the concern determines whether it's worry or just a concern and an opportunity to trust the Lord. If you are concerned then you'll seek Him, and you'll trust Him with the concern. If you worry, you have that concern, but then you'll try to figure it out yourself, or you'll fret over it, or you'll try to make things better, or you'll just make yourself sick worrying. We must understand that legitimate concerns come, but we must respond appropriately and not worry. Third, we must embrace God's sovereignty over the greatest to the smallest of details in our life. Look at verse 25 again at the end. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? In other words, God's in sovereign control of life. How much more than food? He does food too. He takes care of our life and our bodies. And he takes care of our food and our clothing. He's sovereign over it all. So what should we do? Trust him. Not worry. Our lives are securely resting, as we saw in Sunday school today, in the all-powerful sovereign God. <laughs> We're at peace because we know He's in control and He loves us. And He's a good God and a good Father that provides for us. Nothing is out of His control. And that's good news, isn't it? We have peace. Though the world's crashing around us, we're not worried. Why aren't we worried? Because we're trusting God. Fourth, we must counsel our hearts to look at the objective truth over our feelings and emotions. This is what we see from Jesus in verses 26 to 30. He talks and ask those questions, those rhetorical questions. And I want you to take note of those, and I want you to think on those again. Those same questions you should be asking your hearts, beloved. 
all the time. How well did you do this week? Were you able to counsel your heart? Wait, 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 wait. Is this thinking objectively? Am I looking at things properly? Am I thinking biblically? Because if God takes care of the birds, that's a very objective fact. He's going to take care of us, isn't he? So we can trust him. We don't have to worry because there's counsel for our souls and it's in the objective truth. Now I know, I know if you're anything like me, sometimes our emotions, those same emotions that are good, by the way, in worship. We were worshiping God and our emotions were in it, weren't we? Hopefully, all of you. We were enjoying God, weren't we? We were delighting God and there were some emotions going. I actually cried. Was that bad? I don't think that's bad. I know it's not bad. Emotions that are produced from objective truth are good emotions. But emotions void of objective facts that God takes care of the birds and he clothes the flowers of the field. If they're not based on objective truth, then our emotions will cause us to do what? Worry. So what does the Lord do it, tell us to do? Counsel our souls. And he shows us an example of how we counsel our souls. We ask those questions that cause us to look back to him and trust him. Fifth, we must remind our hearts of our value to our Heavenly Father. Remind our hearts of our value to our Heavenly Father. Look at the end of verse 26. It states, are you not worth much more than they? Are you not worth much more than they? I have to admit that this verse came to mind when I saw a lady that was imprisoned and put in jail for 15 days because she she took 15 conch, or I think it was 40 conch shells from Key West and she saw the shells and she took them they had the little thing alive in them and they died and you know she killed all these conch shells and supposedly and they're endangered species now I'm not saying go out and kill conch shells you understand but everybody was going crazy. And this lady got 15 days prison, six months probation because she collected 40 shells and killed the conch shells. If we're thinking this kind of thing and, and we put this kind of worth on the things of the world so far to the level that we're killing 60 million babies since Roe v. Wade... There's something wrong. You're going to have a hard time seeing objectively, aren't you? But we're so much more valuable than a conch shell. And we're so much more valuable than a bird. And God takes care of these birds. And guess what? He takes care of us. So we have no reason to worry. We must counsel our hearts that we are valuable to our Heavenly Father. He loves us and cares for us. It, it reminds me again of my, my kids this morning or last night. Caleb and Luke got back from Camp Victory. It's a wonderful moment when the kids come back from camp. They're wiped out tired. But I just... I just wanted to sit and hold him. <laughs> I, just wanted to, I just wanted to hug him. <laughs> I just value them. I just enjoy them. I just love them. I just, if I could have sat there, I had, I know Caleb will hate this and Luke will hate this. Are they here or are they, are they even here? Yeah, they. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Luke. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Isn't that good? Yeah, I just loved it. He got in my lap and we just, just enjoyed each other. I value him so much. I, they bring such great joy to my soul. And if I enjoy my children, how much more does our Heavenly Father enjoy us? He values us. Do we have anything to worry about? No, because we have a heavenly father that cares for us and values us. What a good God, right? 
We must trust in God's sovereignty over our life's length. In verse 27, remember he said, And who are you being wor- by being worried can add a single hour to his life? We can't, can we? Because God's ordained how long we're going to live. And guess what? You're not going to outlive God's sovereign plan for you. <laughs> you're going to die the moment God has ordained for you. Now I know you're saying, wait a second, how do you put that together with human responsibility? Here's what you do. You trust God. <laughs> Don't try to figure it all out. Know that God is in control. Trust Him and do what you're responsible to do. Take care of the temple you have that God has given you your body. Yes, but realize that at any moment you could what? Die and go meet Him. Trust Him. He's good. Seventh, we must prioritize what is truly important. In verse 28 to 30, he talks about this idea. He talks about how God takes care of the lilies of the field, of the flowers of the field, and he dresses them, and he takes care of them, and he does this, and they're even more finely arrayed than even Solomon in all of his glory, the rich man. And yet in all of that, God is going to take care of us and clothe us, probably in glory when we see him in our white robes, those that are... Symbolic of what? Our sins being forgiven and us being right with God. Oh, God's going to take care of us, beloved. And we must prioritize the things that are important to us. Not make an obsession over clothes and material things and stuff. Because we all know that when we die, we're not going to what? We're not going to take it with us. All this stuff we're not going to have. We take maybe one thing with us, but we only take it into the ground. Maybe the clothes we're wearing. That's it. And even that, what? Does it, it stays here, and our souls go to be with the Lord. Beloved, we must prioritize what's truly important. That's what Jesus is getting at. Prioritize what's important. If you prioritize what's important, then you're not going to worry. Because ultimately what we find ourselves doing, are y'all like me? When I prioritize the things that aren't important, like I prioritize clothes or material things or a truck or, or a house or those things, I find myself constantly worrying whether or not it's going to, I'm still going to have it, or I can afford it, or am I going to lose it? He says, the Lord says, prioritize what's truly important. And then finally, last week, and I know I'm reviewing, but this is good, and you need to remember this. I want you to understand it. I want you to take note of these things. Finally, we must have an eternal perspective on everything. An eternal perspective. Because after all, we saw in verse 30 that those things are, even the flowers are alive today and tomorrow they're thrown into the furnace. Beloved, those things are temporary. The things of this world are temporary. The glory to come is far beyond anything of here and today. Today, Everything to come in eternity is what matters. Now today I want to finish up this section. And I know I've taken three weeks, but I'm convinced we need this. I think if there was one issue that the church struggles with the most, I would say worry has got to be one of the top. So we needed this. Let's look on at two more solutions. Here we go. Two more solutions. We find them in our passage today in 31 to 34. First, I want you to notice, we must pursue what is truly important. We must pursue what is truly important. Notice in verse 31, it states, Do not worry then, do not worry then, saying, What will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek First, his kingdom and his righteousness, 
and all these things will be added to you. What glorious words. Once again, Jesus exhorts the disciples to avoid worrying. He gives them a command, starting it in verse 31. Do not worry. The same command that's used in verse 25. Do not be worried about your life here. Do not, be, do not worry then, saying. And he says it again in verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow. Here he says, the second time of the three times, he specifically commands them to not worry saying certain things. This time he gives a summary of what the disciples should avoid worrying about and what we say. Because listen, what we speak is what's going on inside of our heart. We know this, right? And if we're constantly saying, what about this, what about this, what about this? Then that's what's where. That's the object of our attention and our hearts. So he's saying, whatever you're expressing... Whatever you're expressing often is revealing what you're worrying about in your heart. You can see this. You can see this. Do you find this when you're talking to people? It's very quick. You can find out exactly what they're struggling with. As soon as what they talk about is often what they're worrying about. If we look at this, they seem here like perfectly logical questions to ask, though, don't they? He says, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear for clothing? Now, at first glance, we might think here, wait a second, what's wrong with that? How many of you are saying, hey, when you finish service today, you're going to say, hmm, where should we go to eat? Anybody in here? Yeah, we might say that, right? Where am I going to eat? Is that what he's talking about? No, he's not talking about that. He's talking about the heart that's obsessed or concerned with what we will eat. Worrying about it. Now again, for us who live in the 21st century in America, we have a hard time even comprehending that, right? Many of you in here, well, all of us in here probably, have not gone without a meal unless we chose not to go have the meal, correct? None of us, or if any of us, have said... I wonder if I'm going to eat tomorrow or today. That's because we're overly uh, blessed here. We're overly provided for, aren't we? But this same worry can apply to other things in our lives. Just think for a second. Now, the people that Jesus is talking to have the same exact hearts that you have. <laughs> We might not express, hey, I'm worried about whether or not I'm going to have food today. But the, still, the heart is still there. Their hearts would worry about not having food because they didn't have food. But we, on the other hand, can worry about things too. We have the same heart. So do not worry saying, what will you eat? What will you drink? What will we wear for clothing? Is the idea of having a heart... That has an idol. A heart that is fixed on something other than God. Look, what will we eat? If we are hungry, we don't know where our food will come, where our drink will come, where our clothing will come. So we'll ask this question. Now, at first glance, you say, well, uh, wait, that's not really bad to be concerned about what I'm going to eat, Right? Or do you remember the temptation with Jesus? And Jesus says, but man shall not live by bread alone. It's our priorities. It's, it's what we're pursuing, what we're thinking on. Again, it isn't the question that it's the problem. It is the heart behind the question. It's the heart behind the question that worries and expresses those things. He just told the disciples to petition God for their daily bread. So he's not saying, don't recognize that you're hungry. Don't ever say, hey, I'm hungry. He's saying, have a heart that's submitting to God. And a heart that petitions God. Not a heart that worries and doubts and doesn't trust the Lord. Jesus is saying to his disciples, 
that if they're focused on the wrong thing, the wrong priority, they're going to doubt. They're going to struggle with worry. But notice Jesus gives the reason the disciples are supposed to avoid seeking these things without devotion and dependence upon the Father. Look, right in the middle of the verse, that first verse in 31, or at the verse 32 rather, the very beginning of verse 32, for the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things. So Jesus gives the reason the disciples should avoid seeking these things. And the answer is, because the world seeks these things. Because Gentiles seek these things. Now what are Gentiles? What's he have against Gentiles? Well, at that point, Gentiles were outside the covenant. They were what? Unbelievers. To say Gentiles was to say they are unbelievers at this point. So how does that apply to us? Well, it applies the same way in this sense. That if we're inside the family of God, we're covenant members, we shouldn't worry like the world worries. <laughs> now, y'all know those conversations at the water cooler at work, right? Those conversations that are often, well, my husband's doing this, and my life's this, and what about this, and what if this happens, and if only I hadn't done this, right? Y'all know those conversations. Our conversations and our hearts and our thoughts should not look like the world's. Because that's what the world does. The world worries. We who believe don't worry. We trust. We shouldn't look like the world. The world eagerly seeks all the things that aren't important, don't they? Constantly, everywhere you look, the world is looking for satisfaction where they shouldn't be looking. How about us? Do we look just like the world? Listen, can I give you just a little point of emphasis as you go out into this world this week and you're talking to your fellow co-workers? Please don't talk all about the good things, quote unquote, the good things of this world. What do I mean by that? Well, it's like us that go, hey, did, you, did you see, did you see this fine car that so and so has? And we spend all this time talking about that to our coworkers. What, what happens? We end up saying, this is the priority. This is the thing that really matters. Be careful, beloved. Because when we show them that those things are the things that we value way up here, what happens? We say, that is very important to the world. But as we will see, instead we should seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And as we seek those things and we seek to glorify God and we seek to honor Christ, then, beloved, the world looks at us a totally different way. And we won't fall into the trap of what? Worrying if we don't get something or something may be taken away from us. He explains very clearly, Jesus, worrying about these things, seeking the things of the world that the world seeks, is what we must avoid in order to not worry. Now, I want to define this word seek. It actually is emphatic in the original language. Like it's translated in the NASB in this first one in verse 32. The Gentiles eagerly seek. It means to have an intense desire for something and to be seriously interested in something and then to pursue it. With all that you have. The Gentiles have all these desires. All these things are the unbelievers. The unbelievers have all these desires. These intense cravings in their souls. But we as believers must not have these intense cravings. We must not have this desire for all the things of the world that 
trumps everything else of Christ. We must be seeking God. The unbelieving world is obsessed with the things of the world. Now, I want to challenge you. Are we free to have nice vehicles? Yes, we are. I have a very nice van. I am very thankful for it. I know that sounds kind of funny, but once you have kids, you know, minivans are great. I like my minivan. It's new and nice, and it works. Yeah, uh, short story. Got a two nails in it in the tire. It was so brand new that I took it back, and they replaced it for free. I was like, wow, that's nice. And at any moment, I could be thinking, wow, this is a great minivan. This is what it's all about. Look at me. And I could miss the whole point. It's not about a minivan, is it? My life is not about what I drive. It's not about the house I have. It's not about my material things. But the society, the world is constantly saying, screaming at us, it's about stuff and about, instead of about God. As Calvin stated, our hearts are idol-making factories. It's what our hearts are. We may not worry about a meal or worry about so many other things that the unbelieving wor world worries about, but we are still tempted to worry about those things. It reminds me of the story of the pastors who visited, from, visited America from India. Y'all know India where Hinduism is big. The pastors said, they were believing pastors, believers in Christ, said they could not wait to get home to India because America was a country filled with idols. Now we think it we almost comical. Wait, isn't Hinduism the one that has millions of gods? Oh, beloved, do you see the irony in this? America is a place filled with idols. They're everywhere. Materialism is an obvious one. Stuff. We're obsessed with all kinds of different ones. Now, we package our idols different. We make them look a little bit different. And we call them something different. And we might not officially get on our knees and bow down and worship them. But God knows our heart. And often our hearts are just as committed to our vehicles, our houses, our materialism, our bank accounts, our 401ks, our on and on and on and on. Our wardrobe, our shoes, our clothes, our, right? We are no different. The world that we live in, the society that we live in in America is no better than India. It's a society built on idols. But beloved, we must be different. The sinful heart wants and desires and seeks what it shouldn't. The lost world is controlled by these idols. They want everything but what they really need. Isn't that true? Now, at this point, you can sit here and you can start to get a little self-righteous. And you can start thinking, well, I don't have that problem. <laughs> if you say that, be careful. Because I'm fairly sure that everybody in the room has worried about something in the last month. We can't be like the world. I think it's extremely important that we understand we who believe in Jesus must not be controlled by our fleshly desires. Please take note of this. Even our food, our appetite, our, our desire for drink, and a pleasurable drink. I'm not going to preach on alcohol here, but I will tell you, 
that all the too often we pick things just because it's pleasurable. Do we pick things to drink for the glory of God? That's a good question. I'm not saying, listen closely, I am not saying alcohol is sinful, please don't miss the point. It could be just like me driving by Chick-fil-A and thinking of that chocolate shake at 4.30 every afternoon. (laughs) It's a concerted effort for me to say, no, my wife has food at home and I don't need this sugar. Oh, but it tastes so good. Just go ahead. When was the last time we just said no to some of our fleshly desires? We can tell a lot about the idols of our heart if we're always bowing down to the next pleasure. Are we getting this? By the way, if it becomes a problem... You can begin to say things like this. Oh, no, I haven't had my coffee this morning. Uh Uh-oh, now you're really stepping on some toes. Well, I get this way when I don't have my coffee in the morning. So you basically just admitted that you sin... When you don't get something? Hey, it hurt me too all week. (laughs) Nothing should control us but the love of God. And enjoying Him. Some questions for us to contemplate regarding this. What do we worry about keeping? What are those things that we're just like, oh, I hope I don't lose that. I hope I don't lose that. Oh, no. That should be a warning flag for you. There could be a what? An idol in the heart. What do we worry over in trying to acquire? I've just got to have this. We need to be concerned. Now, at this point, some of you in the room are saying, well, then I can't even leave my house. I can't do anything. That's not what I'm saying. But are we walking in the Spirit at peace with Him and satisfied with Him? Or are we looking for the things of this world to somehow satisfy our souls? They won't. It doesn't. No matter how much money you have, you will not get peace in your bank account. I promise. Another question, what do we seek at the expense of our relationship with God? Often it takes, often... What that is, is what we take pleasure in again. What makes you happy? It's a good question. What makes you smile? If those things are what you live for, then you're going to worry. Because you're valuing the things of the world above what? God. This is what he's getting at in this section. Jesus tells the disciples, don't pursue the things of the world because the world is being constantly controlled by them. He then explains why. Notice it states it in verse 32. Don't pursue the things that the world pursues because your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. Now, I want to take a note here. I want you to understand something. (laughs) 
it's very important. If we're talking about food and drink and clothing, in this time, he's going to provide that very well, isn't he? Everybody in here, we're very well provided for, aren't we? Unfortunately, we're a step away from some of this. And often think that God's going to provide us three, two cars, two-car garage, three bedrooms, two baths. He's going to provide those things. He doesn't promise that. So there's two, for, two disclaimers I want to give to this verse. First, this does not mean that God gives us everything we want. Do you understand? God does not give us everything we want. By the way, just a side note on this. If you're looking at somebody that you know that has more money than you, and you're kind of thinking, hmm, I think they owe giving me something. Sharing that with me, you probably have an idol going on in your heart. Do you understand? That's called jealousy or envy. Thinking that somebody else owes you something. If you have a rich relative, some of us might have some rich relatives. If you think to yourself, well, why didn't they send me a card with their normal $100 in it? Is it possible that we look at these people as our piggy bank? There's a problem. I think we live in a society that thinks everybody owes them something. And the problem is, is our hearts are obsessed with wealth and materialism. But God doesn't even promise us to give us everything we want. And I don't know about you. Anybody in the room glad he doesn't give us everything we want? Oh, I was thinking, struggling through, thinking about my first five, four or five years of walking with the Lord. You know, I was thinking on the if only moment there. If I got everything I asked for then, I'd be a wreck. And I wouldn't be standing before you. I'm sure thankful God didn't give me everything I wanted. Because if he did, he would have been giving me the idols of my heart. I sure am glad God knows how to say no. And he does regularly. God doesn't promise us that he'll give us everything we want. But we rest in what God is giving us. We know that he gives us the essentials, doesn't he? And we see this. He cares for his children. And we rest in the Father and his care for us. Because he knows exactly what we need every second of the day. Again, one of the biggest misconceptions of the Christian life, especially in America, is that we lose out on so much if we become a Christian. Oh, please, no, don't think this, beloved. To say no to something for the cause of Christ, are we losing out on anything? No, we don't need that stuff. We're satisfied with Christ. He's enough. We don't need all that junk that's going to, the moth is going to eat or it's going to rust. We don't lose out in, really think of, in anything really important. In fact, we gain a lot, don't we? I know this goes totally contrary to the prosperity gospel. And they would say this. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he'll give you everything. That's what they'd say. They'll blast that verse out of the, pocket, out of the context. Right? But that's not what he's saying. Beloved, we seek him. We enjoy him. And when we enjoy him, he's enough. And it doesn't really matter what we have. God is better than anything this life has to offer. How many of you agree with that? And we are given by our Father exactly what we need to enjoy and serve Him 
best. We must not listen to the lies of the world. The world desires and pursues what's temporary, empty pleasures. But the reward of God's children is unlimited joy for eternity with Him. (laughs) This is deep, abiding joy. In fact, it's infinitely satisfying to know God, isn't it? There is nothing better than Him. Again, thinking back to that first five years of walking with the Lord and even the four or five years before it, I often tried to find my joy in everything but where it was really supposed to be found. How about you? And it was so unsatisfying, wasn't it? Do you remember? How many of you remember those days? Where you crave and you pursue and you hope and you claw and you scratch and you hope that you'll get this thing or this status or this reward. And then you realize, you know what? I got it, but who cares? Do you have any... I I, I think we moved it a couple of times, but I had all these trophies over selling vacuum cleaners. 200 vacuum cleaners. They didn't call them that. They called them rainbows. 200 rainbows in a month. That's $1,500 vacuum cleaners. 200. And I had these plaques all over the walls. And I strive, I wanted to be the best distributor in the world. I wanted people to go, you know how to sell. You're the greatest. And I'll never forget, as I was packing things up to go, I think it was to go off to seminary, thinking to myself, holding up one of these huge plaques, probably cost $100 for this plaque. What is this? This is firewood. This is useless. Garbage. Any of you have any of those? Trophies? That are now just broken down somewhere and it doesn't matter? Please listen, beloved. There's only one satisfying reward. And it's God knowing and enjoying Him. Listen to the Word of God in Psalm one six in Psalm sixteen. What in the world is going on? Listen to Psalm sixteen eleven. It states this: You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. <laughs> Do we believe that? If we do, we're not going to worry about the things of the world. We're going to be completely satisfied with Him. And our pursuit is going to be who? Him. Notice it states it in verse 33. But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Seek what? First His kingdom and His righteousness. Now... If our eschatology is messed up here, we can think, do everything you can to usher the kingdom in here today. That's not what he's saying. I promise that's not what he's saying. The context has already shown that. His kingdom, his kingdom is to come. It's the glory to come. It's the future hope that we have It's the time that we're going to be with him. So how do we seek first his kingdom? Well, here's what we seek. We seek things that will be enjoyed in the kingdom also. What are those? What are we going to enjoy in the kingdom that we have opportunity to start working on here? What? Answer. Souls. Other souls. Other people. When we seek and share the glory of Christ with others, other people embrace Christ 
And other people then what? Will join us in glory in the kingdom together and we will enjoy him forever. That's what kingdom citizens do. That's what we're about. We're about sharing Christ with everybody we can. And again, if our priorities look the same as the world, when we go to present, hey, let me tell you about the kingdom coming, and they go, what are you talking about? We've got we to find kingdom right here. Then what you've said, if you're the same and you're always striving for the same things, you can't say, no, 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 there's something better. Well, why haven't you been talking about it? Why haven't you been living for it. Do you get me? Do you understand? If our whole life is obsessed with the things of the world, everybody we're trying to take with us to the kingdom and tell them about Christ, they're going to say, no, you're always talking about the things of this world. You didn't really believe that much, did you? Beloved, we have one priority in our life, and that is... To seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he'll take care of us. He'll give us what we need. Finally, we see we must have a correct perspective on the here and now. Now, I know this song, it sounds almost contradictory. Because in verse 33, he's talking about his kingdom and his righteousness. Things that are to come. Well, again, we're working on sharing the kingdom now. With an eye on the future. But his point in verse 34 is another area that we struggle with worry. And it's the final one. It's always thinking about tomorrow. The what ifs, like I mentioned at the beginning. Beloved, I think this is just that final call from the Lord. To have a correct perspective on the here and now. You're living for the kingdom now. You're living to honor and obey the Lord now. You're not thinking about tomorrow. You're not trying to plan out everything perfectly. Now, does that mean... Uh, we got to always give these caveats. Does that mean never plan? No, that's not what it means. Yes, you should have a good business plan. There's nothing wrong with having a good business plan. But if your business plan becomes your obsession and your idol, there's a problem. Because what happens if your business plan doesn't go the way you wanted it to go? Then you will do what? Worry. Have a good business plan. But walk through the day... With an eye on the Lord, trusting Him, not worrying about tomorrow. This is what He's getting at. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble on its own. So as we've gone through this, to conclude, how many of you have struggled with worry in the last three weeks? Why? I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We've preached on it for three weeks. You should be the best non-worrying church in America, right? No, because we're still in these bodies of death, aren't we? So let me ask you a question. What do you do when you come to a message like this and you're once again slayed? Some of us, at the end of the service, you come up to me and say, Oh, you did it to me again, Pastor. You destroyed me. What do we do? Let me give you a little bit of hope. You ready? We all sin. (laughs) Even after becoming believers, we all sin, don't we? And when we worried and when we doubted God, what did we do? We sinned. So what should we do when we are confronted with our sin? You ready? Listen closely. We confess our sins. We say, God, yep, I'm here. Your word, it got me again. I blew it. I need your help. 
will you forgive me? I've sinned against you, will you forgive me? Will you encourage my soul to delight in you above all else? Restore to me the what? The joy of my salvation. May I delight in you above the things of the world. May I have biblical concern but dependence upon you and trust you in all these things. I want you to listen closely. I don't want people to come to Grace Bible Church and walk out in guilt. That is not the point. When Jesus was giving the Sermon on the Mount, he wasn't trying to guilt people. He was trying to get people to do what? Pursue him. Confess your sins and pursue him. So if you're here and you've worried and you've struggled, what do you do? Repent. Turn to him. Embrace him. He is good. He's so good that he sent his son to die on the cross for you. We have a good Savior, doesn't, don't we? No matter how many times we blow it, he's still there with his arms wide open saying, I love you, my child. Come curl up in my lap. I've paid for your sin through my son's death. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement we have in Christ. Thank you for your scriptures. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, to please counsel our souls to prioritize the things that matter. To seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, obeying you and honoring you and glorifying you and prioritizing you above all the things of the world. Help us, God. We need you. Please help us to die to self, die to our fleshly pleasures, and honor you with all that we do and say. We need you, Father. We thank you, Father, for loving us. And we commit our day to you. May you be exalted in us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please stand. Let's sing. Let's stand and worship the Savior. Wonderful, merciful Savior.